Good evening. Good evening, thank you very much for coming. My name is Amy Willis and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all here to our home, Liberty Fund in Indianapolis, Indiana. We are delighted to have as a part of our Adam Smith's Enlightened World program, which is conducted by Liberty Fund with the generous support of the John Templeton Foundation, a wonderful speaker tonight to talk to us about the hidden harmonies of everyday life. Russ Roberts is the John and Jean Denault Research Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. His work shows his interest in how the essential insights of economics can help us understand the world around us and to lead better lives. Russ hosts the weekly podcast, Econ Talk, to which I'm sure you are all subscribed. <laughs> <laughs> Conversations with authors, economists, and business leaders. Past guests have included Milton Friedman, Thomas Piketty, Nassim Taleb, Martha Nussbaum, Michael Pollan, Christopher Hitchens, Angela Duckworth, and Jordan Peterson. The nearly 700 episodes of Econ Talk going back to 2006 are all available at econtalk.org, on iTunes, and on other podcast platforms at no charge. Russ's two rap videos on the ideas of John Maynard Keynes and F.A. Hayek, created with filmmaker John Popola, have had many millions of views on YouTube, have been subtitled in 11 languages, and are used in high school and college classrooms around the world. His animated poem, It's a Wonderful Loaf, is an ode to the emergent order of our everyday lives. His latest book is How Adam Smith Can Change Your Life, An Unexpected Guide to Human Nature and Happiness. It takes the lessons from Smith's little-known masterpiece, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, and applies them to modern life. We're delighted to have many copies of said book available in the cafe, uh, and Russ will be able to sign some for you this evening. Russ is also the author of three economics novels. Yes, economics novels, teaching economic lessons and ideas through fiction. His first book, The Choice, a fable of free trade and protectionism, is on international trade policy and the very human consequences of international trade. It is also the subject of an online discussion at our website, EconLib, through the end of this month. A three-time Teacher of the Year, Russ has taught at George Mason University, Washington University in St. Louis, the University of Rochester, Stanford, and UCLA. He earned his PhD from the University of Chicago and his undergraduate degree in economics from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is also one of the loveliest humans I am proud to know. Well, thank you for those very kind words, Amy. Uh, and I, I actually, I want to start by thanking Liberty Fund uh, for its devotion to ideas, and in particular for its devotion to uh, conversation. And um, Liberty Fund's founder, Pierre Goodrich, valued the exchange of ideas through conversation and through reading. And I've tried to embody that in the EconTalk podcast. Uh, and I have to say, without Liberty Fund, I don't think I'd be a podcaster. And I know I wouldn't know nearly as much about Adam Smith. And I would say that Liberty Fund's support of EconTalk has changed my life even more than Adam Smith has. <laughs> and for that, I am very grateful and very proud to be here. And I thank Amy and Emilio and others here from Liberty Fund for their um, support over the years. Now, as most of you know, Adam Smith published two books in his lifetime. The first, which in its first edition was published in 1759, is The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Uh, he tried to explain in that book why we care about other people, why we do good things, the source of benevolence, self-sacrifice. His second book, much better known, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. Uh, I'm one of those people who I'm a basically, I am an intellectual snob, but I do just like to call it the wealth of nations, which several people look down on me for that. But tonight I'm going to call it just the wealth of nations. I apologize to Mr. Smith. I think it is day. Titles are a little bit different. I just want to get that in. Um, in the wealth of nations, Smith wanted to answer why do nations prosper? Is free trade a good thing? What should the government's role be in the economy? So on the surface, these two books have nothing to do with each other. 
The Theory of Moral Sentiments is a book of moral philosophy, a book about what we would call today psychology and human nature. Uh, the Wealth of Nations is a book about what we would call economics, though it delves into many, many other things as well. But there's nothing in The Wealth of Nations about benevolence or altruism or kindness. Um, so on the surface, they seem to be written by two different people. And what I'm going to do in this talk is argue that they have a lot to do with each other uh, and, and they're deeply related. Now, on the surface, they seem to conflict um, in the following sense. I'd say it's not just that they don't mention each other, which is one perhaps surprising thing. Uh, but the other reason I think people would say that there's a conflict is that in the theory of moral sentiments, it's about that we're not, why are we nice to each other? And uh, the Wealth of Nations is, uh, I think, George Stickler, I'm going to paraphrase him here. It, it, he either said it's built on the cathedral of self-interest or it's a cathedral built on self-interest. I apologize, George, but, but it's about self-interest, at least mostly. So the puzzle is, how could a person write a whole book about kindness and, and empathy and sympathy and then another book that's all about self-interest? And, and what about the natural fact that those things sometimes are going to come into conflict and so on? Uh, and in the 19th century, German scholars wondered how the same guy could write these two books. It's called, famously, The Adam Smith Problem. Uh, that's really not so famous, is it? Most of you probably haven't <laughs> spent a lot of time agonizing over that. But, but it was, a, that's, you know, what can you do for 19th century German academics? Um, so I want to say, as an aside, that I, I really think the German Adam Smith Problem is something of a straw man. Uh, yes, the theory of moral sentiments is about benevolence. But when he talks about benevolence, he calls it the feeble spark of benevolence. Smith had no illusions about who we are. He didn't see us as Mother Teresa um, out in the streets helping strangers. He, um, he argued we mainly want to do good in order to earn the respect of those around us and our own self-respect. Uh, his view of our benevolence and our care for others is captured in his simple phrase, man naturally desires not only to be loved, but to be lovely. Are there any Econ Talk listeners here? So if you played the Econ Talk drinking game, you would drink now. Um, <laughs> just as an aside, the drinking game is going to be available. So in case you didn't get the beautiful wooden version, uh, if you follow me on Twitter, there's going to be an additional 50, I think, for sale in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it's really a beautiful thing. I don't know why anyone would want one, but I like it. It's kind of cool. It's all the has a list carved into the wood, etched into the wood of all the not all, but many of the phrases that I seem to repeat and uh, beautiful pegs to keep track and when to drink and not to drink. Anyway, um, sorry, I couldn't help that. So man naturally desires not only to be loved, but to be lovely. And what Smith meant by that is not the 21st century meaning of the word loved and lovely. By loved, he meant not just loved, not just having affection for, for someone, but being respected, being honored, being praised, mattering that when you came into a room that people would look to you and be interested in what you had to say, what you wore, and how you behaved. That's what he means by loved. And by lovely, he meant not just physically attractive, which is what the main meaning of the word is today, but he meant, and I hope what Amy meant, because I don't think she meant I'm physically attractive, couldn't be. Uh, <laughs> she, by lovely, Smith meant worthy of praise, praiseworthy, worthy of respect, worthy of affection, worthy of honor. And Smith is saying in that phrase, man naturally desires not only to be loved, meaning that goes without saying, of course we want to be respected, admired, and honored, and praised, but also to be lovely. That is, we want to earn that praise and have the respect of ourselves in earning it honestly. So with those around us, we want to earn their respect and admiration. We want to be honored. We want to be loved. And if I always put myself first, I won't earn that respect, honor, and admiration. If I always put myself first, I won't have a lot of friends. And if I have no friends, I'm not going to be very happy. Now, those factors of being honored and respected and how I, we interact and whether I am nice to you and thoughtful and make room for you in our interactions, those don't come into play at the mall. They don't come into play when you're online buying products. So there, it's all about me. Now, I do want to be lovely. I want to earn the respect of those around me. I want to see myself as someone who acts with virtue. But I would argue that Smith saw us as we are. Flawed, self-centered, not selfish, very important, not selfish, but self-centered. We naturally think about ourselves first. We're imperfect. We're prone to self-deception. 
And because we want to be loved, Smith says, we're eager for fame, fortune, and power. Because that's how you get loved. And I always, now I didn't use this in my, I wrote my book because it wasn't relevant, but you know, Donald Trump wandered into this room with Melania because he's always wanted to really understand. He cut his trip to England short because he's always wanted to understand more about Adam Smith. And he sat in the back, you know, but the big trifecta, the triumvirate, fame, wealth, power. He's got at least two of the three. The, you know, the wealth thing we're not so sure about. <laughs> Hard to know exactly, but probably more than me. And so I think we'd be really interested in him. We'd pay a lot of attention to him. You probably wouldn't be paying any attention to me. And if you said to yourself, dude, that's not nice, you'd be turning around constantly just to look at him, just to stare at him. Uh, and that's just the way it is. And what Smith says is that that natural impulse to pursue wealth, to pursue power, to pursue fame, that's not a healthy impulse. That's corrosive. It's going to hurt your soul. It's going to damage you. You're going to do things you're going to regret, things you're going to be ashamed of. He says the other way to get loved is less glittering, he calls it. So the less glittering path is wisdom and virtue, which, of course, is ideal. It's a lovely thing, uh, literally. And he understood that that's a lot less attractive. And he talks about us, again, as we are. So I would argue that it's not like in the theory of moral sentiments we're saints and in the wealth of nations we're grasping greedy people. Uh, it, we're the same human being in both books. Imperfect, self-centered, of course, self-interested, of course, but not totally so. And that's what uh, he explores in the theory of moral sentiments. Now, that story that I just told you, that there's not that big a difference between the two books, that story is also a view of Ronald Coase. He wrote a very nice essay called Adam Smith's View of Man, where he argues that Smith's view of human nature in both books are really pretty similar. We're pretty self-interested, and we're not that benevolent, really. Now, in my book, How Adam Smith Can Change Your Life, I give a related answer. I, would argue, I argue there at the end of the book, <clears throat> trying to talk about how, how we reconcile the differences between these two books, that what Smith's talking about in one book is just a different sphere of human interaction. So in the theory of moral sentiments, he's talking about our face-to-face -face interactions, how I interact with my friends, my acquaintances, my family, whereas in the, in the uh, Wealth of Nations, he's talking about our commercial dealings, where I mainly interact with strangers at the mall, at, on Amazon. When I deal with strangers, my self-interest obviously dominates, and I ask the question, what's in it for me? When I work or play with the people I see face to face, either in my job or in my family or in my social interactions, I have to subdue my natural self-interest. Otherwise, I'm not playing nice with others. I want to earn their respect, admiration, and love. It can't just be about me or what's in it for me. And so in that sphere, I'm going to be much more sensitive to uh, how I'm perceived and how we interact. So. Smith only appears to have two different visions of human nature because we act differently depending on the circumstances. There's no Adam Smith problem because the two books are about two different things. One are small social interactions, the other are larger world of commerce and, uh, and, he, and he, uh, the economy at large. I will say as an aside, that's a little too pat of, of uh, I did put that in the book and I think there's a lot to it, but in some sense it, it does Gloss over, there is a problem that remains that I'm not going to talk about tonight, but I just mention it because I think it's important. The Wealth of Nations is all about how to get rich. It's all about the power of specialization. It's all about national economic policy. Nowhere in that book that I know of do, do, does he say, and by the way, this can be a really damaging thing to only care about money. He says it a lot in The Theory of Moral Sentiments, a lot, in the, and I mean like just twice. Numerous times in the theory of moral sentiments, he talks about how money doesn't make you happy, how pursuing it is a fool's game, how a poor person can be just as happy as a rich person, how the rich person will find that after he gets what he wants, he's not happy after all. So there is a certain inconsistency in the vision of the two books. It's not like he lauds the pursuit of money in the wealth of nation, nations, but it is strange that he does not put any of the caveats around it as you can say, well, he's just writing for policymakers. But it's interesting that for policymakers, he doesn't seem inclined to talk about the dangerous and, and not so healthy parts of searching for money. But so put that to the side. What I want to talk about tonight, and this is all throat clearing, St. Denis a lot of. <clears throat> what I want to talk about tonight is something deep that I think the books do have in common that is easily missed. 
Okay? I do think they're actually part of the same intellectual enterprise, and it's extremely um, important. It helps us understand, I think, Smith a little bit better, but I think it also gives us some insight into the world around us that we might not otherwise notice. And I want to just say as a footnote, uh, a lot of the impetus for me to think in these uh, terms about the two books, uh, I've learned as being the host of Econ Talk, conversations with uh, James Otteson uh, and Vernon Smith, who know a lot more about Adam Smith than I do. And I should also mention an, Adam, uh, an econ talk guest who first got me interested in the theory of moral sentiments, Dan Klein. Dan also knows a lot more about Smith than I do, by the way. Uh, we started off doing a, you know, Dan came to me. I write about this in the introduction of my book. Dan came to me and said, why don't we do a podcast on the theory of moral sentiments? I said, well, that's a great idea, Dan. I've never read it, though. It'd be a little bit awkward for me to interview about a book I've never read, so maybe I should read it. And I start reading it, and I realize this book is unreadable. <laughs> I can't, read, can't make head or tail out of it. Starts off like in mid-paragraph. What's he talking about? Couldn't figure it out at first. Sentences are really long. Uh, but I kind of fell in love with it after a while. And Dan and I did a six-part, six-hour-plus uh, set of conversations about Dan's quirky view of the theory of moral sentiments, which is fascinating, fantastic, and, of course, is available in the archives, as Amy mentioned, with the other 680-plus uh, episodes. So my argument tonight is that there is a central theme uh, in both Adam Smith books. And that theme is a puzzle that Smith is trying to answer in both books. That puzzle is, how do we get along? How do we get along with each other? And I'd like to think of this as I think Smith would call it if he had decided to write about his intellectual enterprise, which runs through both books. It's the problem of harmony. Why is there so much harmony in our lives? Because we shouldn't get along. Now, in our social interactions, I naturally, and I mean naturally because that's hardwired, I want to put myself first. I want to talk, most, not everybody. Inter when I say things like this, the introverts say, I don't. Okay, fair enough. Not everybody. But a lot of us want to talk rather than listen. I want my needs attended to before yours and so on. Now, if we act that way in our interactions, we can't have a conversation. We have what I call dueling monologues. You talk, you make a speech, and I'm thinking the whole time, I wonder what I'm going to say. I have a clever story. I'm going to add this little point. And I add my, my little speech. Then it's your turn, maybe. Maybe my speech goes so long, you don't get a turn. Uh, go to an airport waiting room, which I just did today. Go to the gate where the plane's going to leave from. And what do you see? Most people are on their own. They're staring at their cell phones. They're working on their laptops. Staring off into the distance, they're eating by themselves. The only interaction you usually see is occasionally some families laughing, fighting, squabbling. But go to a party on a Saturday night, or a dinner among friends, or a picnic, or my favorite iconic example of this, because it's obviously trying to capture something profound, a beer commercial. <laughs> like, look what a beer commercial is trying to capture. You see a bunch of people delighting in each other. The beer commercial isn't a bunch of people drinking by themselves, savoring the beer. It's the role beer plays in our joyous interactions with others. Why is the airport this weird exception? Of course, it's a growing exception now. You go to parties, you can see people staring into their, their phones like they're at the airport. But I think we'll solve that. You know, socially, we're struggling a little bit with phone etiquette, I think, uh, right now. But that's going to change and evolve, I'm sure. But why is the airport the exception? It should be the common rule. The airport should capture human life. I'm into me. I'm watching what I want to watch. In fact, the amazing thing about our, our world of entertainment and media is allowed all of us to watch exactly what we want and customize. And I'm sure some of you have seen this in families. In your family, everybody's on their own screen watching the thing they love, right? I don't want to watch what you like, what you're watching. That's not quite for me. So that's, I, don't, I don't think that's a particularly healthy part of, of modern life right now. Again, I we'll see how we handle that. But that should be the norm. That should, and it should have been the norm for the last few thousand years. How do we manage to play nice with each other? And more than that, you know, Smith, I don't talk about this enough in my book, Smith doesn't just say we want to be loved and lovely. That's an interesting observation, right, about human nature, that we care about what other people think about us and we care about our own self-image, that we want to be lovely in our own eyes, right? That's a great insight into human nature. 
But he says something much more, he says it more dramatically. He says, the chief part of human happiness arises from the consciousness of being beloved. Think about how intense that is. The chief part, not like, oh, it's a plus. No, the chief part of human happiness arises from the consciousness of being beloved. That's a lot stronger. It's not just that we find being loved nice or it's a plus. It's the chief part of human happiness. And I, I love this poem, uh, this short poem from Raymond Carver. It's called Late Fragment. He says this. He says, and did you get what you wanted from this life even so? I did. And what did you want? To call myself beloved, to feel myself beloved on the earth. Our most satisfying and deepest moments are the ones where, that we share with others, not the ones where we're alone. How is that possible given our natural self-centeredness, our self-love? I'm into me, you're into you, shouldn't be able to work. Where do the rules come from that allow us to make room for each other, the rules that tell me not to talk about myself all the time, and how to make room for you in conversation? And I used this metaphor before on Econ Talk, you may remember it, this idea of a dance floor. The dance floor is this beautiful, swirling interaction of people dancing, often in small groups where they're together, but then they're also interacting with the people around them because if you don't pay attention to the people outside your immediate circle, you're going to crash and hurt yourself and hurt them, and you're going to act improperly, right? So the right mode of behavior on the dance floor, I would say, in the Smith's world is propriety. There are a certain set of rules that one is expected to follow on the dance floor. You're make, you want to make your partner look good. You want to not bang into the other people around you, right? And those rules, as opposed to, I'm going to show if I'm the best dancer out here. That person loose, doesn't get invited back to the party, is, is laughed at or thought a fool, or he actually hurts other people who are out on the floor. So who writes the rules for the dance floor? And of course, we write them together, right? The rules of social behavior, the norms of what's proper and improper, and by the way, what's proper on a dance floor in... 1970, in the 1970s with John Travolta, which was actually a lot of look at me, was different than what was acceptable on the dance floor in 1750 at Adam Smith's time, right? So social norms evolve in uncontrolled and emergent ways, but they're out there in time and place, depending on where time you live, depending on where your place, what place you're, you're dancing in. And the rules ironically liberate us because without the rules, we're all at the airport, absorbed in our own fears, successes, plans, it's all about me. With the rules, we create friendships. Now, some are deeper than others, but the deepest ones. And our relationships with our family are what give life its texture and flavor. If we do life right, it's not about me, it's about us. Now, understanding the rules of how to graciously interact with others socially, emotionally, conversationally, and abiding by those rules is, I would argue, one of the keys to leading a fulfilling life. Now, it's not perfect. We make mistakes. We misread cues. We miss invitations for intimacy and friendship. We cross lines we didn't see. There are the inevitable wrong notes that crop up when we improvise with strangers and sometimes with friends. We have faux pas. The rules are inherently, and this is very important, they are subtle and nuanced. And we bump into each, each other, sometimes on the dance floor from time to time in ways we didn't intend or that turn out to be mistakes. But what's amazing is how much harmony we manage to create. There's a set of unwritten rules that emerge on how we behave with each other. We create those rules together, but not through any collective sitting down and writing them out. So I would argue that the moral, theory of moral sentiments is about harmony. The ways we match each other emotionally and conversationally, the way we match the expectations people have of us and have expectations about people we're with, And we try to meet those expectations of the people around us because we know that if we want to be loved and honored and respected, which of course we all do, if we want love and honor and respect, we must think of ourselves and not only, we must think of others and not only of ourselves, even though thinking of ourselves is what comes naturally. Now, the result isn't just a better beer commercial or a better time at the bar or a better time at the party Saturday night or a better time on the dance floor. I would argue the result is civilization, small claim, the norms of proper, decent, polite civil society that makes sure I take care when I interact with other people. I would argue civilization emerges from the unwritten, undesigned rules of social interaction. Where do these rules come from? And here's Smith's answer. He 
says, the all-wise author of nature, presumably God, although you know, some people would say it's just evolution, the all-wise, and it could be both, the all-wise author of nature has in this manner taught man to respect the sentiments and judgments of his brethren, 1759, to be more or less pleased when they approve of his conduct and to be more or less hurt when they disapprove of it. He has made man, if I may say so, the immediate judge of mankind. Now that if I may say so is Smith's way of saying, you know, I'm kind of on God's turf here, the author of nature, kind of a little bit bold to make this claim. So he's, he's showing a little humility, saying the author of nature, whether it's nature or God, has made human beings the police force for behavior of each other. Continuing on, he's going to use a word here called vicegerent, which is like a deputy. He says, he has in this regard, the author of nature has in this respect, as in many others, created him after his own image and appointed him as vicegerent upon earth, his deputy, to superintend the behavior of his brethren. They are taught by nature to acknowledge that power and jurisdiction which has thus been conferred upon him, to be more or less humbled and mortified when they've incurred his censure and to be more or less elated when they have obtained his applause. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying, I want the approval of the applause and the the uh, approbation, for a big SAT word, of the people around me, and I want to avoid the disapproval and the opprobrium and the, dis and the dislike of the people around me for my behavior. Now, that's not easy. We watch and we learn about what's acceptable and what isn't acceptable. Some people call that growing up. Some people never learn. They struggle to read social cues. They struggle to sympathize with, the, with each other and with others. But somehow, most of us learn those rules, and that means we play a part in the great orchestra of life without discord, with harmony. We approve of and smile and honor good behavior, and when we see bad behavior, we raise an eyebrow or we sometimes reject people who we think are, are, are truly bad people. The result is a harmony of people trying to get along. Not perfect, as I said before. I'm calling it harmony, but you can think of this as what, what allows us to go through life creating the complex web of friendship and love that gives life its meaning. All the different levels of intimacy that we manage to enjoy comes from these rules of approval and disapproval that are the essence of uh, what Smith's talking about. Uh, so that's one of the questions I would say that Smith is answering in the theory of moral sentiments. He's asking, how do we get along? He's answering it by saying we get along because we have a natural built-in feedback loop of approval and disapproval that we send out these signals to people and they send out signals to us and we turn and try to match that behavior through our behavior with what is expected of us. But that's also the question he looks at in The Wealth of Nations. How do we get along? How do we get along in the world of business? What's the commercial equivalent of the airport? What's the business equivalent of the airport? What's the economics equivalent of the airport? And it's self-sufficiency. We're all on our own, doing our own thing. And as I say in, in the book that Amy mentions, The Choice, self-sufficiency is the road to poverty. You make everything for yourself. I'm not just talking about being independent and standing on your own two feet, but literally being self-sufficient, you'll be desperately poor. Of course, we're not self-sufficient. That isn't the way the world works. For starters, we trade with each other. We exchange. We have this natural propensity, as Smith said, to truck, barter, and exchange. And he talks about how trade encourages us. Very theory of moral sentiments theme here, even though it's not uh, so obvious, encourages us to be sympathetic to the people around us, to put ourselves in their shoes, to think about what they want, what they like, what they would want to buy from us, what we can do to improve their lives. But that's just the beginning, because the theory of moral sentiments is about cooperation, just like the beer commercial is about cooperation. In the beer commercial, we're cooperating socially. We're interacting and, and making jokes and laughing and sending out affection and using our, our eyebrows and our smile and our eyes and our conversation to dance with the other people in the, in the social setting. But in the world of business, the most profound cooperation emerges, our ability to create complex products without top-down coordination. Now, Smith's example, if you know the Wealth of Nations, and you can just read the first few pages and you'll get to this part. You'll seem like you're really, you know, like a scholar. It's fantastic. 
His example is the woolen coat, a simple product where he talks about the myriads of people that have to cooperate in the growing of the wool and the processing of the wool, the manufacture of the coat, the distribution of the coat, the retailing of the coat, all the people that work together who don't know they work together, who are tied together in this process, who are part of an army to serve you, to bring the coat to your, to your door effectively, that you don't even have to commandeer. You don't have to boss them around. They do it without anyone being in charge. Yes, there are people in charge, say, in the coat manufacturing factory, but there aren't people in charge of the whole complex process. Now, Hayek makes the same similar point in his wonderful article, The Use of Knowledge in Society, where he asks, suppose there's a new use for a product. He is the example of tin, almost as boring as a woolen coat in terms of its simplicity. So there's a new use of a product, for a new use of tin. You know, what's going to happen? What, what, what's going to be set in motion as more people try to buy tin who didn't want to buy it before? And he doesn't say it this way. It's the way I think about it. I'm going to think of three ways you could cope with this social change. One way is to use tin to use less. A second way is to tell the people who won't wear tin, you can't have as much as you wanted. Sorry. You can have some, but not as much as you wanted. And the third way to cope with it is to get the people who know how to get tin out of the ground to go get some more. Right? Those are the three ways you can get more. You can solve this problem that all of a sudden there's not enough tin to go around. Okay? Now, what actually happens is all three things happen. The price of tin goes up. That discourages the current users of tin to try to find substitutes. It encourages the diggers of tin, the suppliers of tin, to go get some more, and encourages the people who had this exciting new version of they something they could do with tin to say, oh, maybe I don't need quite as much as I thought initially. The incredible thing about the price system, it's not exactly in Smith, it's in Hayek, but it's Smithian. The incredible thing about the price system is that even though no one's in charge, that increase in the price uses the information that no single person can have at their disposal, which is, gee, if you're a current user of tin, are there things you could substitute for and get by with a little bit less? So instead of having to do a survey, which wouldn't engender even necessarily an honest response, the price going up automatically encourages the users of current users of tin to say, oh, I guess maybe we should get some, use up, get a little bit less. It encourages the people who dig up tin to dig up more, but how much more, how much the price goes up depends how hard it is for them to go get more. If it's really easy to get more, the price won't go up by as much, which means they'll still get a lot more. People who had currently using tin before this new demand came in, the small increase in price means, well, I'll pretty much keep using almost as much maybe as I did before. So if it's really easy for suppliers of tin to get more, the burden falls more on them and less on the people who are currently using tin, which is exactly what you'd want if you were in charge. And, but if you were in charge, you couldn't find that out. And so by no one being in charge and letting the price do it automatically, we get this social, what would the right word be? Harmony, right? Because think about what it could be instead. Let's have a year-long debate about how to solve this problem. Well, we'll get the, you know, Congress is going to decide. So you need to so write your letters. Current 10 users, get, let's get together and make sure they don't, they don't take advantage of us and, and make sure that, that, that we get to have the same tin we used to have, right? That whole process, you know, the example I really like of this is um, Super Bowl Sunday, biggest pizza day of the year. My wife doesn't care about the Super Bowl. My wife wants a scone. And see, so she goes into a, a cafe on Super Bowl Sunday and says, I'll have a dozen scones. My wife really isn't that kind of person. She has with respect to coffee, but not scones. And she says, I want, I want a dozen scones. They're, they should say, are you kidding? It's Super Bowl Sunday. All the dough went to making pizza. <laughs> Come back in a couple of weeks. We'll have some scones then. That's not what happens. There's scones and bagels and all the other types of things in pizza and uh, pasta. All the other kinds of things that use dough are available on Super Bowl Sunday. Somehow there's this harmony. I don't have to make sure I get mine, right? Like I'm a bagel person. Oh, I hate football. I better make sure my representative knows that enough, enough, enough pizza. Right? Think about it. That's the way the world worked in the past. What markets allowed, what freedom allowed, what prices allowed, is that that conflict gets settled peacefully and no one notices. It's so peaceful, no one even knows there was a conflict. It's an amazing uh, aspect of it, right? Um, So there's no fighting. There's no lobbying. It just gets solved without rancor. There's harmony. A few, million, a few hundred million Chinese move to the city. Their kids start going to school. They buy a lot more pencils. 
You don't show up at Staples and say, I, at the beginning of the year, I'm here for my pen. I'm going to get a couple dozen pencils. Oh, we're out. What do you mean you're out? Yeah, the Chinese bought them all this year. A lot of kids going to school. It doesn't happen. You didn't even notice it. You didn't even know there was a crisis in the, in the pencil market. Amazing thing. So who's the weaver of dreams that makes sure that my dreams don't interfere with yours? There should be chaos at best, war at worst. We don't get either one. We get harmony. Where does that come from? What are the rules that allow that to happen? And the answer, of course, is that there are these feedback loops. Just like in the social interaction, we have the feedback loops of approval and disapproval. And they're just the same thing, right? My approval raises the return to you from finding more tin or being a better person or giving to charity or being polite or whatever it is. My disapproval is like an increase in the price to discourage you, right? So there's these natural, and also I've got, just like I have the freedom to shop where I want, which is a huge part of why capitalism and markets work, I have the freedom to choose my friends, right? And we all know that, right? If I'm not nice, I'm selfish, I lose some friends. If I'm generous and kind, thoughtful, and make room for others, I get more friends. So it's not perfect, it's not a perfect outcome like some mathematical equation, but there's an immense amount of harmony in our social and commercial interactions. Probably really kind of shouldn't be there. Um, it lets us move through the world with our own plans, our own visions, our own dreams without conflict. Equally important, we move through the world in ways we're constantly interacting with each other. Now, the dance floor metaphor, it's not just that I'm dancing with my partner and there's some other people out there I don't want to bang into. I change partners, right? I switch jobs. I have different circles of friends at the same time. I have some people where my friends overlap. Sometimes I'm in a line dance doing a crowd, uh, 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 um, what's the word I want? Flash mob, right? Right? You ever see that, uh, that flash mob for doe a deer in the train station in Europe somewhere? I don't even like the song. It gives me goosebumps. It's an incredible thing. All these people cooperating and somehow getting along. But that's kind of what we're doing with the tin. That's what we're doing with the bagels. That's what we're doing with the pizza. So incredible. So our social harmony is held together by the rules of approval and disapproval. Our commercial harmony is held together by prices. And they're all, the whole thing works because we have the freedom of association. The result is civilization, the delight of friendship and fellow feeling, the division of labor, that creates our standard of living and allows innovation to proceed without conflict. The complexity of the world around us masks an underlying harmony that allows human flourishing. Smith understood this, and I would argue that understanding how harmony emerges in the face of complexity is the, what he meant by uh, what we could call the invisible hand. Now, this harmony, these rules of approval and disapproval, the price system, these are un unnoticed. Now, the analogy I use, you know how great a thermostat is, right? You set it, if it starts to get too hot, it turns on the air conditioning. If it starts to get too cold, it turns on the heat. It's an amazing thing. The price system is like a house that you build and the thermostat builds itself. There's nobody who designed the price system. It's like, hey, let's have a thing where if something gets expensive, you want less of it. And if it gets uh, less expensive, you want more of it. And that way, it'll create so a commercial harmony. Just kind of happens naturally through the forces of nature that we want more of things that are inexpensive and less of things that are more expensive. Incredible thing. Just like we care about approval and disapproval of the people around us. Now, it was Vernon Smith who pointed out to me Amazing thing. Adam Smith was born during Isaac Newton's lifetime. Isaac Newton died a little over three years after Adam Smith was born. Well, they probably never met. I don't think Isaac dandled Adam on his knee. But what's obvious, it seems, or at least it's conceivable, Isaac Newton's revolution of how the world worked must have electrified thinking people all over the world, but especially uh, in the United Kingdom and in the associated circles where Adam Smith was. And think about what Isaac Newton's intellectual enterprise was. He wanted to understand why there's harmony in the heavens. And he realized 
that it was a hidden force, gravity, that kept the planets from crashing into each other and going off their orbits. The harmony of the spheres, which he, certainly Kepler, I'm not sure about Newton, but certainly the um, astronomers at various times of human history have actually thought the planets produced music, real, what we would call, I might call real harmony, or capital H harmony, right? Harmony is a beautiful word. It, it conveys an idea of, of, of non-discordant musical notes that go together to produce a sweet and uh, powerful sound. Newton, the Newtonian revolution was the idea that something we can't see is making the universe work in a way that is harmonious. But that's what Adam Smith's doing. Adam Smith is doing the same thing here. Newton out there, Smith here. Smith's trying to find the unseen forces that create the harmony of human interaction. I think Smith discovered those hidden forces that hold us together, that make our orbits around each other both socially and commercially and commercially so harmonious. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to do some uh, Q&A. And if you'd raise your hand uh, and look for the uh, folks with the microphones, and um, we will um, Hi, thanks. Hi. Um, so I have a, a question about harmony in the theory of moral sentiments. Um, a few remarks. First of all, one could make the case that actually Smith didn't see the problem, that he was too optimistic about how naturally harmonious we were. For example, David Hume actually did see the problem and goes on and on about how if we don't adopt the general point of view, things will go bad in all kinds of ways. So one, one, one issue is whether Smith actually, whether he noted that there might be something, a problem, something to explain here, whether he wasn't too naive and optimistic. And then in terms of what you actually said about this, so I mean, I think there's a distinction to be made in TMS between the psychological and the normative layer. If you, if you go for the psychology, I actually think you're focusing on the wrong thing. What makes us harmonious is not this... Uh, um, uh, 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 desire for approval, which I'll, I have a, a bit more to say about that in a sec. It's actually the this, this satisfaction we get from mutual sympathy, which, sympath which Smith just takes as a brute fact. If yeah. anything, I think that explains the harmony more. And indeed, about this, this, uh, this approval from others, Smith, you actually noted this at the, at the beginning when you talked about the distinction between uh, loved and lovely. What we care about is not just mere approval, but being worthy of that approval. And wh when that actually will not, that desire will not be satisfied usually by actual spectators, only by the impartial spectator. That's where the normative part comes in. It's not like we actually, this desire is usually satisfied by the interactions with actual people, because Smith goes on and on about how they might not know all the relevant facts, they might have a personal stake in the circumstances. And so it's actually the impartial spectator that ultimately satisfies the desire to be worthy of approval. Which where that's where the action really is. So just just a couple of comments. Yeah, it's always awkward with somebody in the audience has read the book you're talking about. But um, <laughs> I, 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 those are interesting points. I, I agree partly with some of them. Uh, I don't agree with all of them. I, I'm, but I've forgotten some of them now. Um, <laughs> what I agreed and disagreed with the. I don't think, I think the point about sympathy is well taken. Smith has, uh, talks about our ability to put ourselves in the shoes of other people. It's a limited ability, but it's there. It's almost, again, hardwired. Uh, and I think that does have a role in harmony. So I agree with that. And I should have or could have talked more about that. Um, the, I don't think, I would never call Smith naive, ever. Although, uh, he led a somewhat sheltered life. It's an interesting thing. He was not a very, um, from reading his book, you'd think he was quite a man of the world. He actually um, led a, a fairly sheltered life. He never married, lived with his mom a good chunk of his life, spent his time tutoring um, the Duke of Buclos' uh, son going through Europe. Uh, he didn't spend a lot of time in pin factories, I don't think, uh, but he did write about them. <laughs> but I wouldn't, I, wouldn't call him, um, I wouldn't call him naive. I might be naive in my telling of Smith. 
I may be overly optimistic or overly um, pat in trying to squeeze the theory of moral sentiments into a framework similar to the wealth of nations. And uh, I would just finish uh, by saying that in the theory of moral sentiments, Smith decries the man of system who sees the world as a through a certain uh, narrow lens and thinks that everything can be moved around, people can be moved around like the pieces of a chessboard and, and, and has a social uh, vision. Um, I think Smith's mainly talking about, say, Mao um, or Stalin uh, before his, their time. Uh, but you can make that same critique of, of some approach, of an approach like mine, where I'm trying to give you a lens and not everything fits into the lens, I, so I accept that point. Uh, and um, you know whether it's a useful lens through its simplicity is uh, is always uh, up to the to the listener. So you can you can think about it, Alexander. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Oh, Roberts. Um, I have a brief question to do with the theme of tonight's talk, which is the everyday har harmony of everyday life. And you know, you spoke eloquently about Smith's uh, vision of the way that norms are organic and, and work together and, and mesh and um, are informed by our desire to, to, for, for love and, and to avoid disapproval. And I'm wondering um, both your thoughts and Smith's thoughts uh, on you know, when norms don't produce this magnificent mellifluous symphony, but maybe something quite more grotesque. And you know, when norms are not tools of justice, but injustice, sure. and um, don't respect human dignity, like that is your water fountain, and this is mine. You know, and just kind of there have been these times in history where Absolutely. these norms that have developed organically have not served kind of the broader uh, theme of, of of justice. So it's a great question. Uh, to come back to uh, the earlier comment. If there is anything naive about Smith, it's that, you know, Smith's drawing on a, you know, when your best friend's David Hume, you don't necessarily have a random slice of, of human life. I mean, he talks about, <laughs> he talks about a wide range of, of humanity, however, and he's quite respectful, um, which is quite striking for his age, right? He doesn't share the biases of his uh, time in many areas. He's not a, he, he doesn't, He's incredibly respectful of um, primitive people, the primitive people of his day. Um, very um, uh, respectful of the dignity of, of primitive people, quote, uncivilized savages, and yet he speaks up for them in a lot of settings. Uh, doesn't see the Irish in a, in a, um, ca as a caricature, as many people did in, in his time. So I, I want to say that. I want to say that first. At the, on the other hand, the social circles he swam in, uh, and I'm moving away from the dance floor to synchronize swimming. It's a little kind of a creepy, <laughs> weird image. Uh, Hume and Smith in bathing suits. I, a little strange. Uh, in caps, of course. Uh, smiling constantly. Um, definitely getting, definitely beyond the UK team uh, that year. It's maybe, maybe only the Scottish team, maybe not the English team. Um, but more seriously, I, when you hang out with gentlemen, which would be the one way to think about it, you, you tend to see how gentlemen behave. But of course, there are people who aren't gentlemen or women who are not so dignified, not so thoughtful, not so nice, could be racist, could be whatever, fill in the blank. And there are many norms that are horrific that emerge and are persistent uh, about the inferiority of certain types of people, genders, race, religion, et cetera. So I never want to suggest that, uh, in particular, emergent order, uncontrolled processes always lead to good things. Uh, I think you can make the case that they often do, that they ever do is really to be remarked on and to be honored and, and to be humbled by. Uh, but, but I think your point's well taken. that You don't want to uh, attribute some sort of magic goodness to um, these kind of processes. And Smith may have been prone to that given that he uh, hung out with lots of people who were good, probably pretty good human beings, um, which could lead you to be a little more optimistic about things than, than you otherwise should be. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, again, thanks Russ for coming. Good to see you again. 
Uh, I want to push this question just a little farther. What about the critiques from lots of people that what markets end up doing is they coarsen our life because they direct us to that other sphere, and it makes us greedier, and it makes us nastier people? Now, there's the other side, but I'd like to hear your take on that. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I have a, a strange, I'm going to give you a, a really strange take on it that I'm just starting to think about that, that is, um, that's on my mind. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sharpen your critique that you're quoting. I, I know it may not be yours, actually, but um, that you're suggesting many people have, which is, I would call it the commodification of life, the idea that everything is seen as an object, uh, the idea that uh, we should keep score using our income uh, and that capitalism, uh, you know, it's, it's one of two things. It either impoverishes everybody or it makes them too rich. It's, you know, it can't win capitalism. Uh, it, it's a, it's a no-win situation. Um, but here, here's what I think. I think there is a, first I'll give you what I think Smith would say as best as I can. And then I want to give you what I've been thinking lately. So I think Smith would say the following. Smith had a very different perspective. Could be because of the times he lived in. Uh, could be he wouldn't have that perspective now. But in Smith's day, what Smith suggests is that capitalism, as I mentioned, forces you to think about the other person. And it's not a coarsening. It's a broadening. That it forces you to smile at the customer. It forces you to... Think about what the customer's needs are. The idea that you can force somebody to buy something they don't want or don't need, Smith would find bizarre and, and Im immoral also. But you know, even without immorality, it's not a very um, effective way in business is to try to make lousy products and convince a lot of people and hope that they'll buy them anyway. So I would say, for starters, um, I don't think Smith would argue that, that markets are coarsening. And I think. The subtler point I would try to make is that I think there are cultural aspects to exchange that make it very difficult to just call it either nasty or glorious. So most people think you shouldn't be able to sell a kidney, okay, or buy a kidney. Um, a lot of people die in America because not enough people give them away. So I don't want to ever romanticize that, right? And yet people do. Oh, if we, if we sell kidneys, it'll be commodifying. And we wouldn't want people to put a price on life. And we shouldn't introduce a commercial motive. But if you say to them, oh, so doctors should work for free? Oh, no, 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 of course not. Well, why not? What's the difference? What is the difference? And let's be honest. Because doctors don't work for free, because people don't teach for free, there's a self-interested motive there that complicates the provision of services. Not every doctor is a saint. I, I have many close friends who are extraordinary human beings and are incredible doctors who go beyond the call. God bless them. I also understand that they have a monetary incentive to use the tools that they have to prescribe the drugs they're rewarded to prescribe, to do the therapies that give them more money. I assume they don't always give in to that incentive, but I wouldn't be surprised if sometimes they do. And I wouldn't be surprised if they deceived themselves. I don't think they sit around and say, I have a hammer, therefore everything is a nail. Um, I, I think they think everything is a nail sometimes. So surgeons like to do surgery. They, they're prone to saying, you need surgery. I get that. So, so the first answer is, it's complicated. It's not as straightforward as either. It's, it turns everybody into a noble saint, caring about the people around them, versus it hardens you into a selfish evil, dark person who finds ways to get people to buy things. It, right? It's complicated, like all of human, human experience. But I want to say something else. In the United States today, th there is a misimpression in my view. It's not, um, I'm in a minority here, but I believe that the last 40 years of American life have been very good to most every American who was alive 40 years ago. This is considered a radical view for some reason. The view that most people hold is that, that the great majority of, of Americans have been treading water for the last 40 years, and a handful of people at the top have made all the money. I, I think this is false. There are certainly numbers that suggest that. 
what I, th that claim. I think those numbers are distorted and wrong. Okay, and I've created a, a multi-part video series. You can send me an email. I can show you why I think that's true. But let's put that to the side. Let's accept that it's true. Let's accept that it's true, and this is true. There is a lot of inequality in America. No kidding. There are people who make a lot, and there are people who, who don't make a lot. And I would argue that it matters how they make a lot. If you make a lot by making a lot of people happy, that's different than if you make a lot by, say, getting a special privilege from, from, uh, from the government or stealing or fraud, defrauding people. So I think we should be careful about the peop how people get wealthy before we decry whether wealth is good or bad, ex large, large amounts of wealth. Just to take a simple example, uh, uh, Stephen Curry, great basketball player, makes a lot more than Magic Johnson did, a uh, great basketball player. Is that because he's greedier? Is that because the system rewards him more for his, uh, it isn't, the system does reward him more. Why? Is, because, is it because, he, he again, he exploited the system? That's what I meant to say. Or is greedy and exploited the system? No, it's because basketball is a much more popular sport. People watch it all over the world that didn't watch when Magic Johnson was playing in the 1970s and early, late 70s and early 80s. So they make more money. It makes more people happy than Magic Johnson did. You can still argue he should pay a high tax rate. Nothing to do with it. But the process by itself is not corrupt or a form of cronyism in my view. Okay. Here's the point, though. If all you think about is the measurable, and income is very measurable, strikingly hard to measure, it turns out. So that's part of my point. Particularly strikingly difficult to measure how much better or worse off someone is today than they were 40 years ago because of changes in prices and changes in quality. It's a long story. But my point is if all you care about is what you can measure, and you start thinking about that as the single largest social problem, which is how much money people make, isn't that bizarre? Think about how strange that is. On the left, they care about how much money people make? About the material well-being? That's it? What about dignity? Right? A lot of people are worried that we're going to have autonomous cars and artificial intelligence, and a lot of people aren't going to be able to find work because there's not going to be any work for them because you can't drive a cab anymore, you can't drive a truck. But that's OK. We'll give them a check. We'll have universal, what's called universal basic income. It'll replace it. We'll be so wealthy because of the productivity of autonomous vehicles and other artificial intelligence, who will be able to give huge amounts of money to people who are unemployed. That's going to be good? Do you think they're going to like it? Oh, but you see, we can't measure dignity. It's not in the data set. So we're going to ignore it. We're going to ignore it. What we should be doing, if we would focus as much attention and energy on making our schools better as we do on complaining about the fact that some people make more than others, wouldn't that make some sense to let people who can't contribute now because they were never educated, they had lousy schools, to give them a chance to do something that is of value to the people around them and feel, oh, so, oh then they'll make money. No, that's, that, of course they will. But they'll feel like they've, they've earned it. They'll feel pride. They'll feel like they matter. They'll feel loved. Right? I wrote an essay. It's, it's a depressing essay. It's called The Lonely Man with a Gun. It's always a lonely man. Have you noticed? Almost always. There's a couple exceptions. But it's, first of all, it's a man. It's not a woman. And it's a lonely man. And you know, this recent tragedy in Virginia Beach, it's like a cliche. I mean, I can't believe that, that they actually still quote, they always find the neighbor. Yeah, it's, off, always, it's always by himself. Really? I'm shocked. Right? They're lonely people who are not connected, who don't have dignity, don't have respect, don't have the theory of moral sentiments, loved and lovely thing working for them. Don't feel loved, aren't loved, don't feel lovely, because they can't find a way to be lovely. So they find a way to be, have somebody pay attention to them. You know, my, my, can't pass a habit in a free society, but I actually saw it in the Virginia Beach thing. The police said, we're going to say his name once, and then we're, we're going to call him the suspect after that. I love that, right? I want to give these people no glory for what they have done, because for them it's glorious. It's a terrible thing, terrible, terrible thing. And the headline should be, Coward Murders Innocent Unarmed People. That should be the headline every time. Coward, right? It's a coward. It's a person who goes into a place knowing that the people are unarmed and murders them. It's a despicable thing. But there's a tragedy under, underlying it. You can debate gun control all you want. It's not about gun control for me. It's not a point I'm making. I'm not, I'm not taking a position on it. I have a position, of course, but I'm not going to say it because I want to open that Pandora's box. But the point I'm making, which I think is more important, is 
How come we, that's, what, that's what we argue about? We argue about the gun law? Now, how could it possibly be we live in a society where more than once every 25 years somebody thinks it's a good idea to kill a bunch of strangers for almost no reason? That, that, something's sick. Something's wrong. We don't talk about that. She can't, first of all, you can't measure it. Oh, we got a dignity deficit. How big is it? Is it getting bigger or smaller? You know, we have a suicide tragedy going on in America right now. Incredible increases in the, in the rates of suicide among young people. Like, oh, th and like the problem is opioids? Well, we have an opioid problem, and it's a serious thing. But wouldn't you want to wonder why people are killing themselves? Something's wrong. I mean, people have always, I mean, Th Thoreau said it, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Nothing's changed. The mass of, of people still lead lives of quiet desperation. But why are there more people leading lives of quiet desperation than there were 50 and 60 years ago? That's what we ought to be thinking about, but we don't. We think about things like tax policy. That's just weird to me. So I think that's, by the way, I view that as the economist's fault. I think we have, have dataized everything and things that can't be measured. Where the drunk under the lamppost loses his keys, and the guy comes along to help him and says, after all, they can't find the, still can't find the keys. And the guy says to the drunk, you sure you lost him? Or no, I don't think I did, but the light's better here. We look where the light is. We don't look where the keys are. We don't look where the keys are. Sorry about that long soapbox speech. Um, last question? Question. Yeah, yeah sorry. I'll so you after. it's a <laughs> couple of questions. So I'm going to disrupt this harmony that we have. Yeah, go for know. it. Yeah, let's, let's disrupt it. So, uh, you know, it's the invisible hand works well. I love it. You know, I'm a business guy. If you don't have an invisible hand, I'm going to charge you more and more and more for sure. the products. But yep. I have competitors, and they won't let me. Nailed it. Yep. And I love it because <laughs> I will charge you more. Oh, by the way, <laughs> I'd expect uh, Amy you to. met that you're lovely because of your mind. And your <laughs> <laughs> I know. And the way kind of a backhanded lead, compliment, isn't it? And, but way, okay. and the way you lead the discussion. <laughs> I think you do a great job. I really enjoy it. Let's throw a monkey wrench in this. And let's throw government controls into the pricing in the free market. Sure. So now you have to deal with minimum wage. Yep. And so how do you deal with minimum wage? I'm biased. <laughs> I think minimum wage have, have filled up the corners and folks don't have jobs. But what do you think and how does it impact us? And then let's look at the medical, medical uh, expenditures in this country. Sure and um, how the consumer doesn't really see pricing and what's the impact there. And, and let's have a long discussion on that. Well, uh, <laughs> we've got negative seven minutes. So we can't, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to try to give a quick, it's a great, great set of observations. I'm going to try to give a quick answer, which I'm not capable of, <laughs> which, but I'll do the best I can. And then we'll continue it. For those who also wanted to ask and didn't have a chance, we can continue with the reception, uh, where I'll be happy to uh, sign books if you if you want one. It's very awkward, by the way, when when you offer books at no charge and not everybody takes one. So even if <laughs> even if you don't want a copy, if you see there's some left, could you just take one and give to a friend or whatever? It just it really hurts an author's feelings. Um, but I want to answer John's question because he asked. He said a great thing. First, I, I just have, I know it was only a prelude, your, your invisible hand comment, but I, I got to say something about it, which is uh, one of my favorite things. My former colleague at George Mason, Walter Williams, used to say the following. He says, here's my relationship with my grocery store. I don't tell them when I'm coming. I don't tell them what I'm going to buy, and I don't tell them how much I'm going to buy. But if they don't have it when I get there, I fire them. <laughs> Go somewhere else. It's a tough thing running a, a business, right, when you have competitors. If you don't have competitors, you know, we're the phone company. We don't care. We don't have to. It's fantastic. Um, minimum wage and um, health care. So I think the minimum wage is a cruel policy that helps a group of people at the expense of another group of people. Among poor workers, the most skilled among the poor usually get a raise. The least skilled are going to get fired or are going to have struggle to find a job. And I think that's just the wrong way to help people. Um, it's true that we don't have time, fortunately, for me to list all the good things that government intervention does. 
I'll mention one. Uh, pollution, if I dump my garbage in your backyard while you're asleep, and you wake up in the morning and find garbage in your backyard, I got rid of my garbage without having to travel far, and I impose the costs on you. And that's not nice, and that should be punished. And there are different ways to punish it, some more effective than others. But I wouldn't say, well, hey, anything goes, free market. Right? So I don't want to suggest, that, similar to the earlier question, that everything you leave alone turns out great. It doesn't. Um, but I think your healthcare points, the one I just want to focus on, a lot of what I talked about tonight was the power of feedback loops. And as you very eloquently pointed out, in healthcare, we've broken those feedback loops. We've done the same thing in a bunch of places. I'll just mention the two I care the most about. One is healthcare, where we basically say, if you buy it, you don't have to pay for it. Someone else is going to pay for it. That usually then gets that someone else to care, but that's a much less effective feedback loop than when it's you. Now, we understand why that's a good public policy, what are the benefits of that public policy. The benefits of that are people who struggle to pay are still going to get the thing. But that's a wonderful thing. It means that we're going to waste a lot of money, though. So we have this weird world now where people say, yeah, our spending is so inefficient. Yeah, that's because we give it away. We subsidize it. It's because we let a third party cover the cost for poor people, old people, and people with jobs that have insurance coverage subsidized through the tax system. It's a really bad system for spending your money efficiently. It's really great for creating lots of innovation. So we have fabulous drugs, fabulous devices, many of which don't work nearly as well as they say they do because, hey, y'all hey, yeah, have it. You know, my favorite, because I'm not paying for it. My favorite example is a friend of mine, 80 years old, goes and gets eye surgery. And after the surgery, he's telling me, he just mentions off handy, yeah, I can't remember whether you're supposed to always look up or look down. I can't remember. But after this surgery, you're supposed to do one or the other. And I notice he's not doing it. And I say to him, you know, I notice you're not looking down or looking up, whatever it is. And he goes, yeah, it's too much work. I'm thinking, you know, if he had paid the $25,000 that that surgery cost, right, he wouldn't be doing that. He'd be looking down or looking up. You say, oh, well, it's his eyes. You think he's not going to care? Well, he's old and I don't know. He's used to not having great eyesight anyway. So it's an improvement. Maybe it'll work pretty well. That's absurd. That's a crazy thing, right? Much worse to me is I have a choice between a generic drug and a, uh, this is my true story, it's coming out in a little sneak preview of an upcoming Econ Talk episode where I confess to having, I think I've probably told the story before because it's such a horrible and great story. I've got toe fungus, toenail fungus. It sounds horrible, it's nothing really. But my wife says, is there something wrong with your toenails? I say, yeah, I'll go look. So I go to the dermatologist. Oh yeah, she says, rice beer prescription. I go to, the, to CVS, to Walgreens across the street, $1,200. $1,200 to fight the toe. Toe fungus has no, it's purely aesthetic. It's, it's not even itchy. It's nothing. It just doesn't look so great if you look closely, okay? <laughs> I said, $1,200. She, she says, oh, don't worry. It'll be a lot less. I'm thinking, that's supposed to make me feel better? <laughs> someone else is going to pay. Are you telling me, who's, is someone going to pay the $1,200? Yeah, it'll be a lot cheaper. Yeah, it's, it turns out it's like $35, okay? So I'm thinking the difference between twelve hundred and thirty-five is that paid for by insurance company? Did they negotiate that? How could this possibly be? And then I find out that there's an over-the-counter thing for toenail fungus that's like six dollars. Oh, but this works quicker. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm, forget the thirty-five versus six. I'm supposed to impose costs of say something like twelve hundred dollars, so I can get extra week of toenail-free fun fungus-free toenails. That's despicable, but that's the way our, our pharmaceutical market works. So just one more example, and this is a little subtler. Insulin is incredibly expensive, and it's a glorious drug. It's a wonderful thing. And by the way, I have many friends in the pharmaceutical industry. They, they, are, they do unbelievable things. They cure diseases. They prevent diseases. They mitigate diseases, and the process is unbelievably expensive. So I never want to say, oh, they, they're, they're horrible. They're not horrible. They're following the rules of the game. Now, it's true. They sometimes write the rules of the game. But they do great things. It's just that I don't think the system is designed quite the way it should be. So in the case of insulin, just for example, you can get generic insulin at Walmart for $25, right? Now, it turns out it's not as good. It doesn't work as fast. It has lifestyle implications. I'm, I don't think everyone should have to buy $25 insulin, but a world that says... You should never have to have the less effective drug, no matter what the cost, is a world where we're going to create drugs that are unbelievably more expensive for a tiny extra benefit. Now, in the insulin case, maybe it's not so tiny, and that's an interesting question. 
But in the toenail fungus case, that's a mistake. <laughs> Something went wrong there with those incentives, those feedback loops, right? So last thing, and Amy's ticket, he's still talking, darn. Last thing, the financial crisis, to some extent, was a way that people could lend out money recklessly and get their money back from my, by going into my pocket, Mr. Taxpayer, okay? That's a little more complicated than that, but it's not a lot more complicated than that. It's part of what happened. If you know that when you lend out money imprudently, you're going to get your money back, you're going to lend it out more imprudently. That's not rockets. There's nothing complicated there, right? And if you know the person who's going to get it back doesn't know he's sitting at the poker table, that's me. So when your losses pile up, oh, just get it from that guy in the corner. He's the taxpayer. He doesn't really know what's going on. Yeah, yeah. You got a direct line into my bank account through the tax system, right? That's kind of what the medical system has right now through Medicare and Medicaid. It's a way that if you spend more, it's okay. We'll get it from you. It's not a good system, not working well. So those are two areas where we really need to try to do better. Okay, folks, thanks so much.